Welcome, everybody. I call to order the work session for the 26th proposed general government operating and capital budget, and we need to go around the table and introduce ourselves. Um, we'll start here. Uh, Lance Silver, OMB Director. Ethan Berkowitz, Mayor. Pete Peterson, Assembly. Bill Evans. Jennifer Johnson. Patrick Ford. Dick Training Assembly. L.B. Gray Jackson. Tim Steele, Assembly. And. Amy Dombowski, Ladies always. And we have two assembly members on the line. Please um, state your name. Uh, Bill Starr, Assembly. Ernie Hall, Thank you. Okay, um, the administration, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I just wanted to make a few quick introductory remarks since we're going to hear more from Lance and Mel and suspect some others about our public safety budget. I just want to emphasize public safety is a priority. It's a priority with the Assembly, um, and it is a priority at the, the people of Anchorage. When you look at some of the conditions that exist in our city, so the expansion of SPICE, some of the, the rates of domestic violence and sexual assault, and a lot of what's going on today is attributable to the fact that we are understaffed at the police department, and there's a clear causation and correlation. So we put a premium in this budget on running three academies, bringing the numbers of officers up to recommended standards. At the same time, we want to make sure that we increase the response to the capacity of the fire department while increasing the number of firefighters, which ought to reduce the amount of uh, overtime. So with that as background, I'll turn it over to Lance. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So um, members of the assembly, uh, based on our based on your comments from our original sort of large overview of uh, the budget as a whole, what we're going to do today and next Friday is a format that I believe that you're familiar with. Um, we've invited uh, the departments to come and sit with us as their particular slides uh, come together. I will do a summary of their proposed 2016 budget and certainly afford the assembly and the opportunity that they might have for department heads. But, but before we begin, begin I um, want to dip into a little bit of um, the, uh, the Format. We're going to do, as the mayor said, public safety today and then review those departments that are under the municipal manager. With the exception of uh, PM&E and traffic, they could not be here today. They have some other appointments. And then um, we'll go into the CFO's office. Next week, we'll start with the executive and legislative branches of the mayor, the assembly, the attorney. Then we'll go into Chris Schutte's group for next week. And then there'll be a separate presentation available for each of those. So what I wanted to do is start off with a reminder for those who might not have been available, and this is a little bit more detailed than the large overview of our, where we are and what was being proposed. In this slide, you'll see um, uh, differentiation between revenues and expenditures and the going from 2015 to a continuation budget and what the uh, continuation difference is. And then on the far right, the last three columns illustrate the proposed amounts of expenditures and revenues in, uh, in our proposed 2016 budget and the change there. Many of these numbers are going to look familiar to you. If you look to the right, uh, our proposed total budget is $278.7 million. The, uh, the uh, change the difference, the different change is uh, roughly in the property taxes, about in property tax revenues about 11 and half percent and then again uh, we'll go through each one of these maybe get down into the um, other revenues the 10.6 is primarily a combination of the loss of MLP and um, the uh, state revenue sharing thank you and so this is really a, a highlight overview of where we are in the budget and at the end of uh, where we started with is an 11 million dollar gap This is a uh, really a very large breakdown of um, the funding that we that we're working with and the changes that we have adjusted. Again, 
The 7.28 does are some uh, an adjustment as it relates to the five majors, uh, area-wide police, fire, parks. Um, the 15.3 million, again, that's a combination of the MLMP dividend, uh, some solid waste. Last year we had a $2 million um, dividend from them that's not included in this budget. The state revenue sharing is 4.7 million of that, and some adjustments in use. So, so that is a reduction in our revenues available. Some of the pluses uh, in uh, property tax revenues for a total of 4.3%. Um, it's really difficult to make this simple, so I tried to make it simple. If you take the 4.3%, the way we do a tax uh, calculation, it's a combination of growth, both on population, CPI, new construction, that portion of the 4.3% is around 2% of that 4.3, and then the property tax adjustments would be roughly 2.3%. Um, but I've done some, maybe some other numbers that you might find uh, helpful. If uh, So right now for a $300,000 house, the uh, your property taxes are um, uh, 2 $2,288. The new amount is $2,342. That's that about $50 difference. So um, those are that's the dollar numbers of the adjustments. We have some other changes in local revenues. Um, I'll remind the assembly that the administration is proposing um, some adjustments in revenues that require code and others that are do not. We would uh, we have I would think that on the 23rd of this month we have a separate work session strictly on the revenues. Um, we can talk to each, uh, about each one of those. So, and then there are some variety of uh, changes that uh, moving down on the plus side. If you have any questions on these, um, we'll go through those as well. The last one here is a. Uh, I know the Assembly Member Dubowski or Assembly Member Johnson asked what was the actual modifications in the staff. This is a summary sheet of the pluses and minuses. So the 2015 column shows uh, what the total amount of staffing was. The 2016 is what it would be. If I can draw your attention to the third line where it says development services. Development services is a department in 2015. It was a division in 2015, so we didn't show any numbers there. In 2016, it shows 73 positions. It's literally um, the same amount. In, in 2015, they had 72 in the Development Services Division. In 2016, they'll have 73 with an addition of an electrical inspector. So if you don't see any figures in 2015, it's because they were a division. In 2016, they're a department. I'm trying to explain um, all of those as well. I will point out, and I think uh, Chief LeBlanc will bring it to your attention as well, in the submit, in the, if you look at fire department, the goal, as the mayor mentioned, is to increase the fire department by 10 firefighters. Um, in the submittal on what we put in the proposed budget, the actual position count is 377, not 387. This is the target that we are achieving, so when we do an S version, we'll need to modify the positions neglected to uh, put those in the fire department. So I'll uh, be talking to the chief about how we're going to close the gap in those positions. As I think, as uh, the mayor mentioned, you know, part of the need for positions will be balanced with reduction in the overtime. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we do that. So I want to bring that to your attention right now. Um, the rest of the changes, I'll ask the departments to speak to them individually if you have specific questions. So um, again, I hope this is familiar to you. The bottom line is a growth in uh, two positions. So with each department as they come forward, police, fire, uh, and those with uh, maintenance operations, parks and rec, they do have a proposed capital budget. And so we organize the presentation so that when they're looking at their reconciliation page for 2016, it will then be followed with a conversation about their proposed uh, capital projects. As I mentioned in our session last week, while there is a list of bond projects and a list of state projects and other projects. Um, this is a sort of a starting point for the conversation. It is not meant to be that that would be the uh, bond amount or the projects that would end up in the bond. That's obviously a conversation that we will have uh, with the assembly in formulating our bond package. Similarly, 
as the mayor prepares his legislative program based on an approved CIV. Um, we're going to look to those list of projects and um, and some of those to be uh, submitted to the legislature. It seems pretty uh, logical that we're not going to submit a $268 million legislative request list based on their current state status, but we do need to be tactical and strategic about what we do ask for because we do are proposing some uh, matching programs that I think benefits both uh, our infrastructure and gets the leverage of the state dollars. So we're going to ask the uh, departments to recognize those as well. So really that's a highlight level of what I wanted to share with you. Um, what I'd like to do next is invite uh, Chief New and Chief Tali to come up and uh, talk about their departments. I'll give a quick overview of their slides and then um, and I'll turn it over to them and ask you if you have questions or if there's something they want to add. And, you know, I've, uh, I would ask and encourage the departments to you know, share with you the things that, that uh, you know, how their business is running, but not spend a lot of time you know, talking about their entire department, but highlight some of the things that are relevant to this budget, both pluses and minuses. So with that, um, your first slide is uh, the police. So so for the police department, so for the police department, the top half of the slide, um, as the assemblyman recall, there is a, a significant amount of one-time funding. That's the top top portion of the, of the graphic here. Um, so what we do when we create the 2016, all of those one-time expenditures, while they may be, uh, may, while they may repeat, such as an academy, we take all the one-time expenditures out before we build 2016. We make some modifications to debt service, and then if there's some changes in existing uh, programs or fundings for 2016, pluses and minuses, calculate uh, that which gives us a continuation of 2016 for the police department at about $98 million. And then based on um, the administration's desires and goals to increase public safety, we are increasing the police department above a continuation for the list of items, uh, academy, supplies, uh, the actual academy itself. They have some additional one-time uh, software uh, increases for point of sale, some software upgrades they want to do and then changes that they are proposed for some total of a new budget of 100658000 for the police department. And that includes 20, a growth of 20 officers in the force. So uh, I think with that, um, maybe just real quick on the capital side, and the chief did, the chief's going to talk about this one here. Many of the projects you'll see here are very familiar, um, and that's really to upgrade some of the equipment they have for response. Okay. If somebody has any questions for APD, doesn't look like it. Well, sorry, Mr. Dombowski. I always like to hang back. You know, coming What's this milk? Since milk we're there, so she's the not sure who that is. Ask the question too. Um, what is the strategy moving forward with APD? You're, you're bringing in 20 new officers. Are you going to reinstitute trafficking? Are you going to reinstitute the gang unit? Are you? What do you? What are your plans for these 20 new officers? Well, our initial focus is getting more officers in control, and then proportional of rallying support uh, units. Okay, so... You, you recall the, the first report of 2010. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> We're having the primary authors in that report uh, come in uh, later this month. Uh, there will be a report for you before the budget process is over. Uh, they're going gonna, gonna to make sure those numbers are valid and that we um, change any of that aren't. And give us a updated trajectory for so that we know exactly where to put all these bodies to accomplish all the things that the first report always intended for us to do. But certainly it is improving the call, getting into community policing and rebuilding the special units. I appreciate that. Thank you, Chief Mew. When you, um, as you move forward in this process, um, I know in past years we've had trouble running, um, maybe from the fire department side, but we've had trouble being told that you know running two or three academies just there's just not manpower to do that it, do you think it's going to be a challenge running three different academies in the same year or is this something that's really doable 
it will be challenging for Chief Todd. <laughs> uh, however, we're working on plans right now, and that's Mark Perf is going to help us on that and make suggestions. But uh, our command staff is already working on uh, adjustments to the recruiting process, the lengths of the academies, um, maybe uh, doing staged uh, academies so that we have more room in the year. Uh, in other words, there are some functions that a patrol officer probably doesn't need right away in his or her career, like in depth crime scene, detective, or uh, processing, or something like that. We could shorten those academies and make more room for more academies. So there's a lot of adjustments we're considering right now. That's just one of, of many, but um, that will be uh, will take a lot of work, but we're committed to doing it. I appreciate that. And following up, um, last question, I think. Um, on the academies themselves, um, you know, we've heard a lot of discussion around, well, you can have all the academies you want, but we're just not getting quality candidates. Um, so what is the strategy for recruitment? I know in some administrations there's been a big push for out of state. I personally have always thought in state the more likely to stay and not just come here and train and leave. But um, you know, are we gonna are we gonna really focus heavily and try to you know steal some of the troopers or what is? <laughs> I'll just say it how it is. <laughs> but um, all all fair and love and war and policing. So um, what is the recruitment strategy? Currently, about half of our recruits are local and about half of them are out of state. Um, we are contemplating a new way of testing and recruiting out of state. And I don't want to go into details yet because the uh, ink's not dry on this, and I'm getting out in front of a lot of people here. But um, and we're on to a new strategy, a new recruiting strategy, targeting a different. Uh, there's some things that appeal to the millennial generation, if you will, that um, that we need to consider in our recruiting strategy. So between that and um, finding a process, and we think we've identified one, a testing and, and, and uh, evaluation process that limits travel and, and rounds up more of the interest in the lower 48 and doesn't put uh, hurdles in front of them. Um, we think those two initiatives, which I'm not describing in detail right now. Will I know where you're going. It's okay. We have also um, been talking with the troopers um, about their plans and the implications of the, their budget crisis. And uh, I don't believe they're going to be having layoffs, but um, there are changes in over at the troopers that may cause some of them to be um, um, Looking for another option? Perhaps. <laughs> uh, but in any event, we're definitely considering lateral cap. Okay, I appreciate that. You know, and it, just some of the things that we saw with the fire academy that we put on at, for paramedics specifically, I think if we can bypass some, I mean, some of those people, there, all those people are coming with certifications and those things. So those streamlined academies, I think for um, rapid fulfillment, fulfillment of positions, sometimes it's very beneficial. So if there's anything I can do, just let me know. Thank you, Mr. Mboski. Mr. Training. Chief Tully, uh, motorcycle cops. We used to have them in Anchorage. They were renowned for the amount of money they brought in, and fines and tickets. Would you please look at reinstating the motorcycle cop division? I know at one time some people didn't like them, they disappeared. But take a look at the amount of fines and fees they brought into the system. Yes, sir. Other thing would be, we're the largest Native community in Alaska, so I may be going through your racial breakdown of your recruits. I want to make sure our recruits reflect the reality of the racial breakdown for Anchorage. Because far too often we don't see the Native component among our inline police officers. I appreciate people from War 48. But if I remember correctly, we went to Cleveland and picked up 10. None of them survived up here more than a year. I would much rather go out to Native community and recruit them, Alaskans, I know will stay here. So I'm going to be asking you all the way through here, how many Alaskan Natives do we have in this class? And I notice on your capital improvement budget, you've got multidisciplinary center construction. Is that the new range or exactly what is that? Uh, the, no, this is the... Um facility that houses our uh, sexual assault investigation okay. unit, the child sexual assault investigation unit, as well as SAR classic cares mm. and other agencies that, that um, investigate and provide services to the victims of, uh, of those crimes. The owner of the building has um, sold the building and they're going to be looking for a new building, so we will either be involved somehow in, in building a new building or paying increased rent for a building someone else builds. So I'm not sure
sure exactly where that goes, but at this point, that's sort of a, a placeholder until we see how this landscape develops. Okay. Relative to the shooting range, it was going to be, it's going to be a multi-use one. Is that still on track? I think we got state money to construct that, didn't we? Out of Birchwood? Um, there was a, uh, uh, we had always, we had gotten stalled out a little bit on the notion that we were going to have to rent it, that land for a long time. But late uh, in the game last year, a uh, this native corporation uh, decided to sell the land to us. So we purchased the land outright. We now own it. Um, that ate into our, um, the funds we've collected, we've collected several, uh, help me out, Steve, probably eight, eight nine million uh, in state um, appropriations over the years. Not quite enough to build. Um, so we depleted that a little bit uh, to purchase the land, which would be very, a lot cheaper in the long run. So we now own the land, but that, that reduced our construction uh, uh, savings account a little bit. And we're now, now that we own the land, we're allowed to bond for it. We couldn't do that before. Okay. Um, so this would make up the difference and round out the project and uh, we're looking forward to it. It will Thank be a regional facility. I remember all the different law enforcement agencies using it. So I appreciate that, Chief. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Training. Ms. Madam Johnston? Chair, if I could ask a question. Um, I'll add you to the list, Mr. Starr. Thank you. Ms. Johnston? Actually, before I ask my question, I have a presentation because I think that to interrupt, or is it just questioning? Okay, great. Um, last, our last academy, Well, we always shoot for 28. And, and in, a per in a perfect world, we would actually find mm -hmm. higher people mm -hmm. well, like 30 mm -hmm. because we typically, if we make 30 offices or off offers, we'll have a couple that won't come. And how many actually started that academy? I think it was about 25. I could be wrong. I managed 25 with you somewhere around there. Does anybody? Orange, are you here? Do you recall? Uh, it's it's pretty accurate. Around 23. 23, so target 28, 23 begin. And then how many did we finish with? Well, we're not done yet. We've lost a, a couple along the way. I guess so that makes me pause. We're doing three academies, as Mr. Um, as far as revenues, um, I, I understand that you have a new way or you're a different approach as far as looking at uh, tickets, revenue. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm so, um, because it's that's been, always been a, you haven't been able to do budget. So oh, yeah. Um, the, in terms of the revenues, we're in the Treasury Department. It could happen because you're going to 
going to have recruits riding being told or practice riding tickets, but the, the field training officer won't be. So, and so are you estimating the same amount of tickets this year as they were last yeah. year? Yeah. yeah. No. The, the revenue sorry, estimates are based on a slight increase in the volume of tickets, a change in the, the value of the tickets, and a change in the number of tickets that are being provided. An improvement in our collections effort, in large part because of uh, the, what we've seen in terms of recent increases in permanent fund dividend. And, and other uh, improvements in our collections process. So those are the three factors that make up the change in revenue expectations from the police fees and fines uh, accounts. And we'll, Dan Moore from Treasury will be here at the work session that is scheduled to talk about revenues. And, uh, and then obviously once the AO is introduced, which I think is slated for the for the second meeting in October for action at the first meeting in November will be available for work sessions or further discussions on, on that ordinance at that time. And, and this is probably a really sure, naive question, but when I first looked at, at the multidisciplinary center construction, I was thinking that was that is not the addition to your current headquarters that has always sort of been out there. It is not. That, that would be a separate structure. It might be on the campus that, that APD is on, or it might be somewhere else, or it might be a municipal contribution to another facility. You can see we've got it in the state grant column there, which is a general indication of a lack of, you know, a somewhat speculative request. Um, but uh, what the chief said is accurate. We are not going to be able to use the current uh, interdisciplinary facility uh, going forward, I think after 2016. So it will be someplace else. Uh, one option would be for the community to build a facility for it. Another option would be for us to continue leasing from a third party as we do now. And real estate services will kind of also give us an, an idea of what we have available and within the municipal property. Correct. Right now, there's no there's no internal option to house the entire facility. Uh, it's a pretty good sized chunk of space, and it's pretty specialized. Um, and there are advantages to having it in the UMED district, um, which is you know somewhat one of the reasons why uh, a facility on an APD campus would be uh, would be suitable. But um, there may be other options as well. The other partners in that program are State, Providence. Etc. They're also in a position to assist with property development as well, and in, in, uh, perhaps even a better position than we are. So we're not locked into a notion of the community building a building. That's and just a placeholder. It, it's the department telling City Hall that there's a need that has to be dealt with over the next 18 months. Any, anything else? Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Mr. Starr? Mr. Starr? Yes, I'm here. It just took me a minute to get the buttons. I have uh, three questions. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll fire them all off at the first, and you can either answer them now or maybe get back to me either way. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, we had the matrix report uh, provided to us some time back that talked about uh, several aspects of, of uh, efficiency and improvement. We've consolidated now to a single um, dispatch program that is the same vendor supplied for the police and the fire. And we looked at the, the ramifications of savings or consolidating facilities uh, in, in your early opportunities as uh, leadership to look at consolidated dispatch. The other question I have relates to uh, any sort of cost that would come with community patrols. Uh, we have a pretty active one out here in the community patrols area, Chugiak area in particular. Does uh, community patrols and the support therein cost any money? Uh, and sort of, if there is a cost, where does it come from? And then I would entertain perhaps a conversation where we would look at uh, bonding for the remaining portion to to uh, start the capital range uh, development um, with the uh, with the local floated bond. If you have any interest to talk about that, I'd like to do it. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Store, Mr. Steele. 
Uh, yes, uh, and I may have missed it, so if I have, um, feel free to ignore the question. But what's happening in Girdwood? What are we, do, is it reflected anywhere in costs for us and uh, where? This budget does not include any additional uh, taxation or spending for public or for policing in outside of the current police service area. So at any of the road communities, highway communities, or Girdwood. So Ms. Johnson, Mr. Evans are working on a proposal with the, the Girdwood folks uh, that might come to fruition, uh, but I don't think that will be uh, likely to be done in time to be budgeted uh, at, in, in this and probably would have to be accommodated at first quarter. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Would you like to follow up, Ms. Johnson? Yeah. Please. There are, there are a number of options. Girdwood has the most options because they have the ability to tax and could provide a grant to another service to provide them public safety. And so that's what we're working with them on, either with Whittier or trying to get the troopers back. The other communities between the Q and Portage do not have a taxing authority. They, they do not have any service areas. Um, if, if the Girdwood model doesn't work, and it looks like their only way for public safety, if they choose to have public safety, will be to expand the service area, and that would not be on the ballot until April. And that has a lot of different ramifications with it. Stay tuned. In the meantime? In the meantime, actually, the communities from the Q to Portage will be like the communities in a lot of the parts of the state and will not will have limited coverage. And, and, and when I say limited, I say, um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, our past municipal attorney basically said that if there were a massive event in any one of these communities, the municipality and the state troopers would, would be there to make the community safe, but nothing beyond that. So it's, 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 it's something that actually plagues a lot of the state of Alaska, oh, and, sure. and we are now there. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Anything else, Mr. Steele? Um, Just a clarification. I, the, the administration strongly supports the efforts that Girdwood and the assembly members are taking in support of that. We have it not included in the budget because of a lack of support, more just because of a lack of clarity of what the exact proposal will be. We're fully engaged and will support whatever budget amendment is necessary, whenever it's necessary, to adapt to a solution that the turning in our communities are supportive of. Thank you, Mr. Abbott. Anything else, Mr. Steele? Uh, no, it's, it, it's just risky, um, but, but uh, um, they do it all over the state, so maybe a community service patrol. Or Thank you, Mr. Steele. Mr. Traney. Mr. Abbott, I appreciate the $5 million that we're going to be getting the plan for that on the 23rd. I want that to go to public safety for them to hold hearing on it. Beyond that, are we adding prosecutors? It's one thing to add, have fines and fees, more tickets. Are we adding prosecutors? Uh, the short answer is no. Okay. I don't then I'll deal with that when we get the to law. The prosecutor's office believes that an, an addition is required even with the fees and fines changes that are being proposed. Okay, then we get to legal. I'll address that issue. Thank you, Ed Mike. Thank you, Mr. Tra Mr. Train and Mr. Flynn. Eight plus 
Academy without you. Is the field training time different for a general recruit? You are. Yeah. 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 Well, that's okay. I'll yeah. Amy, Amy wants to, uh, Amy wants to go with us. Off and on for a couple of years about replacing the existing HHS. She wants to again. They're blowing yeah. the time frame. Is there any sense of combining oh, oh. that renewal refresh with the multidisciplinary center? It's actually, yeah, it, it's one of the sort of the, uh, and I encourage you to talk to when Chris Schutte and Andrew Hopker were here, they're tasked with the, um, uh, with the redevelopment of the PEST facility. So um, uh, they may well, uh, have more information on that than I know of today. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Flynn. Ms. Johnson, the Mr. Training. Sorry to double dip here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Flynn. But who's okay. coming? Hmm? She wants to go last. Okay, everybody. Have, is it just going to be the state because I wouldn't have a burden. I have a thing. Okay. Is it just going to be the state Have there ever been any discussions as far as combining um, or having a joint academy, a statewide academy? We have, we like to run our academies as much as we can, but that doesn't mean we have to use both SIPSA and the Academy of Fairbanks. We've had only a few people train. Um, certainly, we would be happy to join forces with anybody in those things. And often in our academy, we have state employees, although I can't think of troopers, but we often have airport uh, uh, police folks or, or folks from other uh, remote cities that have to look at us. So it is kind of be interested in, in the cost of the cost of the Thank you, Ms. Johnston. Ms. Dombowski. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to go back to Mr. Starr's questions because I think we skipped right over and didn't answer any of them. We're prepared so, to. Yeah. Yeah, I would like to start with the consolidated dispatch, if you have comments on that. This budget does not anticipate uh, any change in the physical location or the organizational structure of the police or fire dispatch organizations. Okay. Has there been any discussion about consolidated dispatch? There is discussion, as Mr. Starr mentioned, we are working uh, towards the use of a common platform, uh, a common information technology platform for the dispatch organizations. Um, but at this point, we do not believe that the uh, co-location and or uh, uh, complete consolidation of the two dispatch functions is in the best interest of either department or their mission. Okay, and one of my uh, follow-up questions was re relating to IT needs, and it kind of dovetails in. So is there anything that you can see that has not been addressed or needs to be addressed or um, maybe is being addressed with your IT needs? I know um, with a new platform, I don't know if there's extra modules or if, in fact, some of the newer modules you're using are, are going to change your processes, but do you have any comments on the IT needs of APD? We are implementing new CAD and RMS right now. As you know, the CAD computer aided dispatch is uh, the same platform for both police and fire. So there will be many, many business process changes as, uh, as we implement these programs. Um, the capital budget that you're looking here shows uh, funding for the 911 system upgrade. That will also drive many process changes at the APD. Uh, and you'll also see the MDT technology refresh. Those are the computers in the cars, what those computers will be. We try and refresh, uh, rotate some out and some in every year. Um, what those will be, uh, how they change, as will be driven by the new CAD and 911 systems. I don't know if they're going to go to iPads or if they're going to still stay armored uh, laptops. But all this is going to be uh, reevaluated and there could be many changes. Okay, with the dispatch, the improvements uh, uh, with technology, are we gonna are we gonna see changes? Because the one complaint that I've heard um, multiple times, if somebody has a medical emergency, obviously first it goes to police and then it transfers to fire, and people have complained about having a you know it takes a, a couple extra minutes. Are we anticipating any changes with that type of uh, with that from the public standpoint? What are people gonna see? 
um, or are they going to see any changes? They, they would not see a change in the structure of that. I, I don't think there's very many cases where someone's had to wait a couple of minutes where their, uh, their communication with dispatch has been uh, delayed by that amount of time. It's clearly a couple of, it, it's definitely seconds, but it should uh, not affect the quality of the emergency medical or fire dispatch. Well, and I guess what I'm referring to, and Mr. Stark had talked about it, I'm sure, but I think he's had this experience where there's a, a medical emergency, and I think he may have been one who called 911, and you give all your information to the APD dispatcher, and they take it all, and I understand that's because they're getting somebody started going there. But then you transfer over to fire, and you give all the same information, and then fire starts asking specific medical questions. So I think from a citizen standpoint, when you're going through that, um, sometimes it's challenging. And then on top of it, um, and I think it's gotten better, because now with a Chigat Fire Department, I know they used to have their own dispatchers, and now mm -hmm. AFD is dispatching for them. Only so that has gotten better, so you don't have maybe multiple maybe we'll catch up with fire. But that's why I'm asking from a public standpoint, you know, I think, um, and I, I'm not a dispatcher, and I'm not in police, so I don't know what the options are or how they do it in the other parts of the country. So typically for us, um, we, if we know right away that it's, it's going to involve fire, um, we don't usually take the, all the information and then transfer to fire. We immediately hot key the call across, and fire and us will be on at the very same time. We'll let fire do most of the talking. <coughs> and they do their medical dispatch thing. So they, they've got it. We might only have it for a few seconds. Okay. Um, we may still be on the line listening in case there's something else we need to tell our patrol officers to do. Sure. So that will continue, and the common CAD platform will allow for much easier handling of these uh, multi-agency calls. I appreciate that, and I just want to put a shout out right now. I've actually sat in all night long, which was incredibly um, amazing that I stayed up that late. but with the police dispatchers and fire dispatchers. And what I recognize is the skill sets and the way they operate is totally different. And um, I was just incredibly impressed with um, with both. But I have to tell you, now that I said something nice, there's been a couple of times, um, actually many times, I've had constituents complain. They call APD and they think the dispatchers are rude. But I think what they don't realize is they're in high tense, high stress situations and they're, and they're really trying to get to the heart, of the heart of it. And sometimes I think the directness kind of comes across as being a little curt, but I can understand after sitting with them for so many hours, I can understand what they go through. So um, <coughs> just a little community feedback there. Not to say anything bad, I, but because um, I was impressed with what I saw that night. Um, the other thing, Mr. Starr asked about community patrols, the cost to support them, what costs are, I know uh, last year, the year before, I've been watching some, the legislature does send some money to our community patrol that I've seen through grants for different things, but for APD, is there any support that APD is giving to any of these com community patrols, or do you have any comments on community patrols? We have not been funding the I'm not going to worry about the time right now. But the, the mayor has uh, okay, stated a number of times his intention to look for ways to provide some more additional support to community hmm? patrols. Okay. Okay. Um, and that's been approved in the last couple of years. Um, but it's not been funded yet. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about that or not. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about it. Okay. Um, but I think the question is that there's a demand or a a desire for more support from municipal government, and we're looking for ways that we might be able to accomplish that. Okay. And um, the last question that on Mr. Starr's side that I, w well, I would like a little follow-up on is the tactical range. So um, I, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but can you tell me where we're sitting as far as how much money we have for that project and how much more is needed for that project? Um, we have, Steve Michael here, 8.5. 8.2 remaining in our account, um, and we propose a $5.6 million bond sale in 2017. That's a placeholder right now. Um, as we start spending the 8.5, we'll be able to refine whether or not 5.6 remains the, the number or not. We don't think we need to get at the money until then uh, because we have money to spend now. Okay, so with uh, thinking that we might need another 5.6 to finish that project out, we have an appeal in right now with the MLMP and their dividend 
that usually would go into general operating government, it appears that this budget reflects I, essentially the worst case scenario, we're not going to get that MLMP money. Why can yeah, we take, or would the administration be supportive of taking that money and setting it aside and using that for the taxable range rather than borrowing if we can have the cash in hand? Um, I, I can answer that. At, at this point, we are not appealing the uh, we've asked for reconsideration of the commission's decision denying the dividend reconsideration was denied um, our we could conceivably have uh, challenged that in superior court uh, based on advice of counsel internal and external counsel we decided not to do that so we do not expect a dividend for from MLNP for 2016. Oh, that surprises me because the last comment we had from the administration was the decision was being appealed. So it's and we did we didn't ask for reconsideration, but I don't think we ever made a commitment to appeal. That was never thought to be a particularly productive or likely to succeed approach. And Mr. Palsy is uh, available to comment on that at your convenience. Okay, we'll probably bring that back up in the MLP discussion. Um, Okay, um, and you know, since Mr. Trini is very excited about using APD as a revenue source with motorcycle cops, maybe we should maybe, maybe we could consider any additional revenue that APD is using to invest in APD, which would be um, this might be one of those projects. In fact, to um, rather than you know selling another bond or going out to people ask people if we actually are if we become revenue generating, I would submit um, let's pay for the projects we already have in in tow. Okay, now moving on to my questions. Um, so marijuana. So with these 20 new officers, whatever you're seeing right now, have you considered in how you're going to utilize these officers or what impacts will they cover the impacts you anticipate um, coming next year with um, the influx we're going to see of marijuana on the market? Thank you. Well, we are anticipating that our OUI cases are going to be uh, more labor intensive uh, to work. If they're straight up, uh, but still no not all cases are it won't be, but we think more and more cases will involve a combination of alcohol and marijuana, and that requires different investigative steps, more blood, uh, that means more refrigeration, uh, it means more training, A ride, and uh, uh, DRE training. Those are acronyms, I'm sorry, we use an acronym. So there are some costs associated with some of those things. Um, of course, we don't have a crystal ball, so we don't know really. We, we can predict the cost of a refrigerator, but we don't really know how much of our blood contract we're going to use. We're, we're making predictions, and I think we reflect those in the budget. But um, we, some, to some extent, we have to wait to see what develops. Have you um, come across or bought, or are they even available for purchase, the testing kits? Because um, I've heard there's different types of testing kits that you can test for um, marijuana consumption. I, I, I don't know. Are those field tests even available? Have we budgeted them in? We understand they're under development, um, but I don't think they're on the market yet. Okay. Now, there are uh, field test kits that we can use to test for product that we find, but in terms of a breath test for a driver, um, I think it's coming, but I don't think it's, uh, it's available for Rest of the yet. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you, Chief Mew. Um, Jennifer asked about Kirkland. Or she just that. Um, SROs. So last year there was a big discussion about um, we have two SROs that are on four tens versus maybe one covering a school on five eights. And uh, in last year's budget, it was discussed that we could potentially, by switching from four tens to five eights, we could potentially save almost a million dollars. So what is the status of that discussion? Um, obviously, I'm recognizing it's not reflected in this budget, and I want to know why. Uh, you're, go ahead. you're correct. It's not uh, reflected in this budget. School and district payment. Hmm. School district payment. Yes, I mean, we should go through with it, but um, the necessity to go through with it appeared to go away last time no, around, no, and so no, we I haven't mean, done it. Could yeah, you revisit it? Yeah, and I would sure, submit right. that we if the city's it. looking at eleven million dollars in less revenue than we had last year, I would I, I would submit that the, the discussion shouldn't go away. And if we can still cover those schools 
at a million dollars less a year, um, to me this is a no-brainer. Um, I recognize there's issues with the contract, and we have to get back in and look at it. But um, again, if we're looking at uh, you know revenue shortfalls, if we have a, a very pretty straightforward way of saving a million dollars, I don't understand why we're not doing that. So we'll, well discuss the, the contract. The police contract that the assembly recently ratified makes the baseline shift for patrol officers, including SROs, four tenths. So. Uh, that it, it, the, the municipality did not bargain for a different shift at that time. Could have, didn't. Um, and so any subsequent change to that would require a change. It would not be something that could unilaterally be accomplished I, by I the department. That. Mr. Abbott, I've been in this conversation for three years now, and I recognize that. And I recognize there's also incentive ways that you can incentivize people to, um, and, and potentially it could be beneficial for both parties. Um, but I recognize it's, it's a contract, and, it, and the contract's an impediment, but it's not a complete obstacle in my opinion. I think it's something that could proactively be um, addressed by both the union and the community. Um, and with that, I'll yield. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mboski. Mr. Wilbur, please continue. Uh, sir, do you have anything to add from the police department? Uh, and if you list the questions, if you have any questions, please send them to me. Uh, our plan is uh, to ask questions throughout the day. And next week, we will compile those and we'll respond to them all at one time. To get everyone all at once. So, <coughs> We're just moving on. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so fire party. Well, we went over about 10 minutes, ago. we'll probably catch up with other presentations, so I'm not worried right now. Yeah, but thank you for asking. Okay, so, um, Madam Chair for the Fire Department, um, I won't go through each one of these, but again, we had some one-time funding that uh, was included in our budget that we did remove. The fire department has uh, uh, also the plan to institute an academy from 2016 to um, accommodate attrition and potential growth. We also have some other requests that we are proposing to be included in here, uh, a variety of different sources, whether it's uh, supplies and equipment. Um, they are responding to a lot of um, calls. So, We've uh, tried to accommodate most of their requests in this proposal. And as I did mention earlier, um, while the submitted slide shows a total position count of uh, 377, of course my previous slide uh, showed 387, um, we need to make some adjustments in showing how those uh, positions will be reflected and working with the chief on actually when they'll get started. So I think with that, um, we've been uh, working diligently with AFD, uh, the new chief, and his team to, uh, to help them succeed for 2016. So I'll turn it over to uh, the assembly if you have specific questions as to what they're track of doing and some of their proposals for 2016. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Wilbur. Mr. Flynn, you want to move? No, call on yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was looking through the mm -hmm. fire budget and just <coughs> raise your hand, but we did hold one time. Okay. Uh, 2015 approved budget contains a 1.5% increase related to labor costs. Early discussion in the case of adequate. Uh, could you elaborate on that, please? Sorry, Mr. Flynn, could you please write me the next one? Uh, this is on uh, Fire Department page 7 of our budget. Thank you. Last one. Yeah, that's on the screen. Let me fix it. attributed to the contract now that it has been 
in fact approved and ratified. So we backed out the 1.2, which was normally a one-time adjustment, and then we added back in as we built the 2016 budget um, the actual anticipated uh, expenses associated with uh, new contract. So did I get that right? Yes. How about that? I don't see it. <laughs> I mean, I'm looking at the line items, and I'm not seeing a $1.2 million add back. That's the $2 million. You see the changes in existing program funding for 2016? Is it $2,067,000? Yeah. The $1.2 was for less than a full year. Um, uh, two million or two point one actually represents the anticipated full year expense. Okay, let, me, let me ask this a little bit different way. The first quarter budget amendment was for twenty fifteen. Correct. This is indicating that that may not have been sufficient and that there's therefore going to be a shortfall in our budget for twenty fifteen. That's how I read that. Am I reading that correctly or incorrectly? I don't think that the ongoing 2015 fire department budget challenge is attributable to the new contract. Anything else, Mr. Flynn? That's it. Thank you, Mr. Flynn. Ms. Johnston? Um, and, and Mr. Weber, you and I have already discussed this. The S version will come out. There is going to be a, an academy. Okay. And, and since we have various schools, UAF, Tell me the difference in cost by by hiring somebody with an AA for um, either fire or EMT and doing short academy versus full fledged academy. Is there any well, first of all, uh, I'm Dennis LeBlanc, the new fire chief, and this is Alicia Richards. She's the uh, chief financial officer. For the fire so we we did a test in 2004 about the actual hiring of paramedics in 2014 at the end of the year. And the cost was uh, slightly less, uh, only because we had such fewer people that we actually hired. Um, the academy was only short by about two weeks, but we can met, we can we increase their work days. So we had five 10 hour days versus a normal academy was four 10 hour days. Um, so it was compressed for a reason. They didn't, um, we don't do the EMT component in the academies anymore. That they have to come with that certification in there. So there isn't a cost savings for the EMT component. Now, with paramedics, is a different deal. That's a whole other scale up. But they still have to be trained as firefighters. Right. Even if someone walks in with a, para uh, a paramedicine certificate, they still are required to go through the firefighter academy. Um, the Firefighter Academy is not where any, any of our trainees learn emergency medicine, whether at the EMT level or the paramedic level. And then, I mean, at some of these graduates, I know Bergwood gets the benefit of, of having them work with them when I'm sure to get to the river. Yeah. I, would, I would think there would be some benefit as far as their training, but they still have to go for the full fire academy. Um, and then I did send you a written question as far as the, um, um, the police and fire retirement fund. And, and my concern there is I, I want to make sure that we're within national norms. I think it's 80% funded is where it usually goes, it's like 75 and 85 percent. So I need to know where we sit on that because there's two problems with closed funds. One is underfunding and the other is overfunding. So that that was the really question that I I am kind of always amazed and and we know that that I spend a quite a bit of time trying to suggest that municipalities should have the management of staffing, scheduling and equipment. And to see the increased payment to the union for kitchen appliances um, I'm just taking note of that. I think those that the kitchens are actually municipal property if I'm not. They are. And in the contract there is a set amount for both um, appliances and um, for appliances and supplies. 
applies for that. And so this budget, that budget amount is, I think, I think the total amount is twenty five thousand dollars, and I think this is twenty six five. In case they have a difference, but we're, we're being as mindful of the contract, and we were very close to it when we were talking to the police department, the fire department about that. So they basically, if they have a stove, they go and buy a stove and then re re reimburse them. Except for new fire stations, it's included in the capital cost of the project. But in the event there's an allowance in the contract for replacement of appliances and utensils at a certain amount by a fire station, and it's accounted for the fire station. So we're um, budgeting per the contract. It seems a little weird. Anything else, Ms. Johnson? I think that's it. For me. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Mr. Hall, Mr. Starr, any questions before we move on? Okay, Mr. No, Wood I don't have. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Bosky. Uh, thank you. Um, just a little bit of discussion. Neither do I. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Hall. Just a little bit of discussion, following up on um, the Paramedic Academy that we recently had. Um, last I checked, we had nine people and one of them didn't work out. Um, so we have eight paramedics on the street today that um, because of that extra academy. That's correct. How has that helped paramedic staffing specifically? Uh, it's helping to gain the burden of, of getting the paramedics to the um, internship now and graduating back to join it. So they are still under um, a little bit of uh, delivery role, role right now. So it should be um, graduating that in March. Okay. Okay. So full, full fledged, full level to operate on their own. And I would assume that's what's accounting for. I mean, once those come online, I know there's a paramedic shift right now where paramedics are being rotated. I'm assuming to help with um, burnout and whatnot. It also helps them on their certification. They have so many hours in um, in that role. So some stations aren't as busy, so they have to go to others. Sure. Yes. Sure. So when these paramedics come online, what is the status going to be of medic two? Uh, Medic 2 is not funded right now. We're using Medic 2 uh, specifically uh, to address the spice issue today. Uh, just had a conversation. I was with uh, Station 1 this morning, and, and that was probably their number one uh, concern was the absence of Medic 2. And uh, I committed to them that we would uh, engage the operations committee, which is representatives of both the union and management, and, and bring that recommendation forward. So, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna push a little bit here because part of the reason um, and w the pitch that I made when I pushed very hard to get this these paramedics or paramedic positions funded was because we recognized there was paramedics, there was ambulances from across Anchorage that were being pulled into the downtown area to deal with the spice issue, yes. essentially. So, if we're robbing ambulances from South Anchorage, West Anchorage, whatnot, to supply in downtown where the demand is higher. Um, it was only fair to the residents of those communities that we fund medic to. And I was being told the real part of the problem was they didn't have enough paramedics to do it. So we pushed for more paramedics specifically to make sure that every area of town had their ambulances, frankly, that they're paying for. So from a contractual relationship, and that's what I'm, you know, if, if I'm pushing to get you extra staffing to fund that rate, and then that rate is not being funded, you know, frankly, I feel like I did my part, and I sold it to the assembly, and I educated everybody on the topic, and we worked together. Ms. Gray Jackson was instrumental in that. But now, if the fire department's just not gonna do that, I mean, we need to reevaluate that. I absolutely agree. That is probably one of my top three priorities to understand how we can get Medic 2 in service. Because we'll, I think three or four times this week, we brought Medic 11 in yeah. and staged it at the Fort Ridge overpass because of short of ambulance. So um, when you're doing that, are you calling Ch Chudiak to backfill Medic 11 or Station 11? We have. Because the one thing, like I said, I mean, taxpayers in South Anchorage, West Anchorage, wherever they are in, around the municipality, they're paying for those ambulances to be in their communities so they have quick response time. And if we're pulling ambulances from their areas, I think um, we need to really look back at, you know, you know what, what, what is our contract as public servants to make sure that they're covered? Because you just can't predict when an emergency like that happens, a medical emergency, especially with ambulances. So, uh, we, we'll be agreed. Yeah. We'll have that research for you. Okay, and um, I just want to reiterate, you know, um, Chief LeBlanc, I know how um, 
knowledgeable you are on the relationship but between AFD and CBFD. And I have seen over my tenure, the relationship has improved dramatically. But I would just say, you know, especially if we're pulling Medic 11, we have got to have a Medic rig in Eagle River. Because some of our areas, and that'll segue, segue me into South Fork, um, I know that volunteer station has closed. And we have residents that lived back there, especially in the, in the winter time. I mean, you're talking about potentially a 20 minute response time. So what effort, or if any effort, is there to potentially have an auxiliary or some sort of um, service, somebody at that South Fork station to service those residents that are so far away from um, well, as you know, the reason why that, that auxiliary unit was closed, there was a lack of resources mm -hmm. in that area. I don't know the last time it was canvassed uh, to see if there are new people who have moved into the area and are qualified to, to become auxiliary. Uh, we, can, we, we can absolutely revisit that again, but it, was the, it wasn't the absence of our desire to have staffing. There right. was the absence of I think there was one guy. People. I think there was one guy that lived out there. But, but that's why I say the, the relationship that we leverage between the resources that are already kind of close to the area, and I know the union will go crazy if uh, volunteers from Chugiak start staffing Southport, but I think we need to recognize the goal is not protectionist mode, the goal is to, to serve the community. Absolutely. And so to me, I don't care how it gets done, as long as it's getting done with qualified people. and. Um, you know, we're doing it as fiscally responsible. Well, that is our mission statement to serve the community. Mm -hmm. if, if the South Fork community wanted to, you know, decide to join the volunteer service area, I don't know that the administration would object to that. Okay. Um, I, I agree. And they are municipal taxpayers. I just want to remind everybody of that. They live in Eagle River. Of course they are. So, um, so they pay for uh, police and fire. <laughs> they're, they're, they're currently in the Anchorage Fire Service area. Yeah, they are. And and they're and not really they, being served. They would rather serve, be served by a Chugiak, um, by volunteers. I don't know that we would have an, a, you know, going through the service area deselection and reselection process. I don't know that the administration would have a problem with that. Right. And I would just go back to, I'm not pushing for one thing or another. I'm just, I'm just saying, unlike the Girdwood area, these are Anchorage taxpayers, and they pay for police, they pay for police, fire, and EMS. And when they are sitting in a service area that potentially has a 20 minute response time, I would say they're not equitably being treated the same as every other English taxpayer. So however we can deal with this situation, I just wanted to put it on your radar and just let you know that it is a concern for the people that live on the high Highland Road. Okay. Um, another question on four packs. Where are we standing? How many rigs is it? I know it's in the contract, but eight. eight. And how often are we staffing those eight four packs? Uh, pretty much every single day. Okay. And when we don't, I get reminded about that. I'm sure you do. The only time that uh, we, we fall behind on the APAC, uh, we've had two uh, emergency situations over the past couple of weeks where we we're basically out of ambulances because of the spice, of it, uh, spice epidemic, and we had to uh, break two engine companies to staff medic two. Sure, sure, I appreciate that. And I'm assuming, um, and I, I, I should know the answer to this because my husband works there, but at the Station 11, um, are we uh, are we staffing Engine 11 with a paramedic and running a three-pack, or are we running a four-pack at Engine 11? I wish I could answer that question. Uh, chief Vignola, who is my Deputy Chief of Operations, would have been here, but he's home sick. Uh, I will get oh, I hope, he, I hope he feels better. Um, the only reason, I, you know, I'm, I'm very um, adamant when it comes to staffing the Eagle River because you know they're so far away from everybody else. So when we take one person or a rig out of Eagle River, if we have a structure fire, the challenge becomes, do you have enough people to manage that fire before reinforcements arrive? Yeah, we'll, we'll get you that answer. Okay. Um, now, um, let's talk about your rig replacement schedule. Where are we stacking up with the, with the, with the rigs? How many rigs are you anticipating in the next year or two have to be replaced, and and how how are we managing that? Uh, we're we're managing it not as well as we will be in about six months from now. But uh, 2016 is going to be a great year for new apparatus. We were able to uh, through the 2014 and 2015 bonds, we actually have, uh, and then if you look at the 2016. Uh, 
let me just speak to 2016 real quickly. Uh, fire ambulance replacement, that's four. We're going to bring in three traditional uh, box van type ambulances, and then we're going to add a fourth, which is a sprinter. The sprinter is a new tire uh, ambulance, uh, new design, uh, cheaper, uh, not necessarily uh, most preferred by the paramedics, but, uh, but we want to be able to uh, test where other countries, uh, particularly in Europe, have gone uh, and have adopted this sprinter. It's a single body ambulance as opposed to a box on a chassis. And that's what we've been driving right now. And those boxes on chassis uh, can't be crash tested uh, just because of the design. The sprinter is a one uh, vehicle apparatus. So we're going to try that, but, but three ambulances plus a sprinter. Uh, we're going to replace uh, Heavy Rescue 4, uh, put that into reserve, and that's the 900,000. And then we'll get, we're going to replace five uh, Life Pack 12s with the new Life Pack uh, 15s. AFD will get three of those. One will go to Girdwood, one will go to Chugiak. Uh, but in 2016, we're actually going to get three new engines coming from the 2014-2015 bonds, uh, three new tenders for water trucks uh, for the non-hydrogen areas. Uh, uh, so new trucks so with a new filler, actually yeah, known as Cranker Mobile. Those of you who have seen okay. uh, uh, the Seinfeld show, uh, it actually has a, uh, a second engine gear. Won't that be the only tiller we have here It'll in Anchorage? Be the only Why are we going to that model? Uh, a lot of it is due to the downtown area they will be serving. It's a design that will allow access into areas that have tighter streets, tighter okay. narrow areas, you can turn easier. Okay. So it's a big, long straight vehicle. Oh, that's great. Okay. Yeah, it's been, it's been um, it took us a while. We got the bond approved in 14. We researched it and mm -hmm. came to the conclusion that is the best purchase for the department. Okay. And you see those in many of the northwest cities. Portland, for example, has a number of utilities in it. As, as, as Alicia said, they're very, very effective in tighter areas and, and for ambulances. Okay, so as we're bonding for all these fire trucks and everything, what I mean, when we look, when we take an engine or an ambulance, pick your druthers, ambulances obviously get more use than engines do, but um, what is the useful life of it? And then talk about the, the length of the bond, because you probably can see where I'm going with that question. That's an excellent question. The ambulance is um, really growing to reserve status after about seven to eight years based mm -hmm. on volume and what is happening to it. Uh, the trucks engine and tenders are a little bit different. Tenders get very little mileage, so they last a lot longer. Um, engines, 15 to 17 years is their lifespan, and trucks is about the same. Uh, we have standards that we do for replacement based on NFPA, so they tell us when some engines have to be retired. Um, because of the technology and stuff. Most of our fleet is more mileage. Um, some are getting close to the, the mandatory retirement for age, um, particularly attenders. That's why we're doing the community ones. Um, yeah, and and we're, so we're, in the, we're selling basically 20 year bonds to cover these fire trucks, right? It's been discussed. Um, yeah, it is. So um, I don't know what it would take to get there, but. Um, you know, legally, if there are certain things in code that prohibit it, but we'll have to talk about it. But here. I think mm -hmm. a far more realistic okay. way to deal with this is start to build in a replacement fund and actually right save, okay. build the fund rather than bond for something that we're still paying off long after it's been retired, especially if we're talking about ambulances that are five to seven years. So it has been in discussion. Mm -hmm. Well, there's an option we do in a few cases for roofs. Uh, in the municipality, there um, there could be an O and M increment added to uh, a bond, which would allow for the essentially depreciation for uh, rolling stock like ambulances. And ambulances would be a fine target for that because they do have relatively short useful lives by comparison to other uh, fire and rescue gear. Sure, and I guess I wasn't really talking about. I mean that's an interesting that's an interesting uh, take on it, Mike. I, I didn't think about adding an increment to a bond. I was thinking about adding into the the budget basically a line item every year to allow for replacement. 
and um, you know because we know it's going to happen. So and why not start saving for it? And one of the commitments that I've made to uh, the mayor and the manager and, 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 and Mr. Wilbur is to develop a formal life cycle replacement model mm -hmm. for all of the apparatus within the fire department. Uh, we've been doing a good job, but of course, as you know, there's the age of the equipment, there's the miles, there's the hours on the uh, engine itself, and you get to a point where maintenance costs begin to exceed uh, the norm, mm -hmm. and uh, Jeff Patilla, who's the lead mechanic, uh, interesting, in 1981 when the maintenance facility was built, uh, we had six mechanics. In 2015, after some 35 years of additional apparatus, we have six mechanics. So uh, we will put together a formal life cycle replacement model, which will program, a, it'll, it'll program all of that up for you. I appreciate that because I think you're going you're going the right way. We know it's going to happen. Let's have a plan for it. Essentially, I appreciate that. Thanks, Chief. Chief Levant. Last question. I promise. Um, well, maybe. <laughs> um, speaking of the shop, uh, a couple years ago, I went through the shop, and the shop, frankly, is in. Um, I, I, I don't, I'm amazed how they can maintain the AFC fleet in that shop. It's cramped. The floors are crooked. Um, we fixed the floors this year. Oh, did you? Yes. <laughs> It's because yeah, I haven't been back this and year. And we fixed the lighting. We did two things. We uh, painted the interior uh -huh. so it reflects more, and then we uh, put LED lights in, which creates a much better ambient. Um, and how? Last time I was in there, I, I mean, they had installed this new ventilation system, but it wasn't turned on when I was in there, or maybe it was, but it was still. I, I'm surprised people can work in there without passing out, frankly. How is the ventilation yeah, doing? Yeah, it's on and working. Now. Okay, good. Um, last thing, with the old Station 3 that was right there, I heard the shop was moving, over, kind of taking over some of their space, or that was proposed anyways. Where are we going? Because they are very, very cramped over there. They are. Uh, there is strong consideration to using the, uh, the street level bays, where Station 3 is now, as basically a light duty shop. Mm -hmm. The challenge in doing that is just logistics from old Station 3 to the maintenance facility, uh, moving mechanics over, and moving all of their tools over, um, and we're working through that. Uh, but yes, we will, high probability, we will expand into the surface bays, the street bays of Station 3. Okay. There's no current plans to dispose of uh, current or old Station 3. Right. right. The, the, the plan is for that to stay in fire department use at this time. Um, okay, I did think of one more question, sorry. So speaking of old Station 11, out in Eagle River, so it's across the street yep. from Station 11. Um, last time I walked in it, now I know they're using, I, or I've been told since I walked in it last time, now they're using it a little bit for storage, but really what is the need for that building and is that something that we could dispose of? Because um, I had walked in it one time and it was virtually empty. I think some remember my, my walkthrough and then they started using the storage, but what really, that facility, what really are we using it for? And is it really the best use? And is it something that the municipality can frankly sell? I haven't been in it since I've been back. You know, Alicia, do you know anything? Um, it is currently being used for warm storage in the winter time. So in the summer, it may be empty because the apparatus is, is out um, in their stations. So there, but it is, we've just done a little bit of repairs to it to kind of clean it up, make it look a little bit better. Um, we don't have an intention of selling it this time because our warm storage is so limited in what we have available to us, especially with. Um, station 71, old station 71, going to be sold off. So we lose that facility. If at this time there's no uh, plan to sell it, I'm sure you're putting your boats in it right now. Yeah. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what's in it right at this moment. Well, it's much better use than when I walked through it because yeah. I wasn't impressed. But yeah, we, we, I think that was rectified. We took out one of the demo one of the walls so that we could use it more for storage of the apparatus. Okay. I'll do a field trip and update you on. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, I promise I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Dimboski. And, and just for the record, you know, as the legislative branch of government, we really appreciate your questions. So thank you. Um, Mr. Wilbur, the schedule that you sent us um, has a break schedule from 1 to 110, and I'm going to suggest that we take the break now. Um, and so we'll be back um, at the work session at 1232, and we'll start with employee relations. So we have a 10-minute break, everybody. Um, we're going to...
uh, move on and uh, continue with our work session. Mr. Wilbur, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, next on our agenda is our employee relations. And um, so uh, employee relations is just, uh, their adjustments are pretty minimal. And um, we're going to have some adjustments as it relates to positions um, with the reduction of one. And they want to use some of those, adjust, some of those savings to modify some existing positions. But overall, pretty constant. So with that, I'll uh, turn over to the assembly. If someone members have questions, we have the employee relations director and some of the staff in labor. So. Uh, Great. We have a question from Mac Abbott, don't we, Elvie? I'm sorry. Don't worry about it. Thank you, Mr. Wilbur. Um, I don't see anybody. I um, really? Yeah. What kind of first Mr. Boss? <laughs> I do. Um, so, with regards to employee relations, specifically hiring over AWW, has there been any uh, discussions about allowing AWW to fund and pay and uh, have their own ER person over there to kind of expedite the hiring process for some of their positions? Okay. Well, let me first answer why we have those positions in house. I'm still evaluating to make sure that we're handling everything consistently across the municipality as far as employee relations and other. Relations and those sorts of things. So for now, we would like to keep those in house because I have identified some areas that we need to improve on to make sure that we're handling these situations as consistently as possible with cost. So what what um, is you going to identify? Thank you. Thanks. Well, just in dealing with um, labor relations issues, we have people in different locations. We've identified um, past some situations that weren't handled consistently. And if that goes to a higher level, then it's a little hard to defend. If we're doing something different in this area and this area, and we're trying to say that, no, we handle these situations consistently. And I, I guess it goes back to, um, I remember when everything was centralized within ER here in City Hall. And I remember before that, too. And so it appears to me that, um, and, and just watching the budgets of the last couple of years, who you know, obviously, um, they have rate payers that pay for a lot of their services, and they, they um, I'm not going to speak for them, but the observation was made that um, some of their technical positions were taking a very, very, very long time to get through ER here at St. Paul. And so sometimes those centralized uh, services in one group doing everything is, uh, on its face, it sounds like, Bill, that makes sense, but sometimes I think especially with what I've seen here at the municipality, I think sometimes efficiency is lost actually by doing that because it gets stuck in a bureaucratic um, funnel, like a choke point, because everybody's coming for you. And AWU has some incredibly um, unique positions that they have to hire for. Very few people across the country sometimes are qualified for these jobs. So I think when you look at that, I think we have to step back and, and recognize that one size doesn't fit all, and sometimes you have a unique um, skill set that you're looking for and frankly they have a service that if, if they have something they can't get hired or get through the process for six or eight weeks it can have a dramatic impact on service and we're talking about a basic health service when we're talking about water and sewer and um, I think that's something that should be considered and um, you know AWU's done it before they've done it efficiently and I think um, it might be something to help relieve uh, employee relations burden as they're bringing on all these new police officers, all these new firefighters, all these things, if you can um, just evaluate that. Because I think, honestly, the cost benefit would be there in the service um, if, if you were to allow something like that to occur. Um, but that's just my two cents. You're, you're not going to usually ask, hear me say that you should decentralize something, but in this case, I've watched the troubles and the str struggles that employee relations has had in the city, and I'm not sure that one department of X amount of people really can handle the city of Anchorage at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abbott. Thank you, Mr. Bossy. If I could just follow up before I go to you, Mr. Flynn, if if, if it's okay. Um, you know, in the past, I've heard, both Mr. Traney and I have heard complaints from departments about the hiring process taking a really, really long time, and that was in the past. So I'm hopeful that um, under the new administration and a new e ER director that things will change. 
No response. It's just my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Flynn. Any questions, Mr. Starr, Mr. Hall? Okay, um, Mr. Mr. Wilbur, please continue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilbur. Um, before I go to Mr. Training, I just have one question. What's the source, the funding source for um, the DHS building, the thirty million dollars? What is the other? Yeah, what's that funding source? Um, I don't know about the top of my head. It, there is no uh, committee funding source for that. Okay, so it's just other whatever whatever you come up with. Okay. Well, you mean the other on the right. that's there? Oh, I'm right. sorry. No, that's Thank CDBG. You. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's CDBG funding. I, I thought you were talking about something in one of the out years. No, no. Which is a different program. No. Thank you. No, that, I, I apologize. That's CDBG funding. Okay, thank you. Mr. Traney. I was hoping to see something in here that added an increment for the animal control and care facility. I'm not seeing one in here. We're using a model that was built in 96, I think. We've not seen any new officers. Mm -hmm. So my question to the administration is why? And what would be a reasonable amount of money for the assembly to bring forward if we decide to increase the amount of officers there? I've been told six is the amount of officers they need to bring them up to what a town our size should be providing. So please tell me. Well, I can tell you why there's not funding in here. The I'd like to know. has proposed funding for that, but in this year we were not in a position to recommend that addition at this time. So you find other places to use the money rather than here? Police and fire. Okay. So no other money? The only departments you're going to hear about that are seeing significant adjustments or changes in their service levels. So I won't find money other, any other department than police and fire? That are getting significant changes in their service level? I think that's probably true. Okay. Uh, but we will bring you uh, what those, you know, if you're interested in knowing what additional funding could provide in terms of service improvements, that is something know. we can't provide for you. I'd like to know because I, I've had a email from the Animal Control uh, Board that says, hey, this is the amount of money we need to provide the service 
for a town our size, and you're going to get a lot of calls from the animal people that are out there because Alaskans love their animals. And I want to see how the amount of money we need to bring this level of service up to where it should be. So you'll be hearing more about it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thanks, Training. Chair. Um, I see uh, Ms. Johnston. I'm confused. Didn't we use that that $200,000? In yeah. this year. Yeah. We did. Oh, yeah. Oh, if, it, if it's in the 2015 budget, uh, one time or otherwise, right. it was spent. Okay. We just or, didn't uh, commit it. Uh, uh, sure. We just aren't asking for it again. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Uh, looks like there are no other questions. Please continue, Mr. Wilbur. Uh, go on to uh, maintenance calculations. And I'd like to have more Robinson come up and us. Alan Chikowski is the um, division manager, director of the department. Alan is out of town right now, so mm -hmm. he's uh, now. In back um, east on location. Uh, so, I believe when there's a snowstorm. Increasing their budget as it relates to the direct cost for most of the uh, one time uh, voter approved bonds. They have some other uh, uh, in their no. reorganization. And then, frankly, their proposals for changes to 2016 are as a result of um, fuel and then uh, a proposal to. Reduce their contractual snow services by about a hundred thousand out of a little over a two million dollar contract, and then uh, they have a capital program on the next slide that uh, has to do with facilities, program upgrades. And this is a proposed list that the assembly will then discuss a little further and sure about which of these were might be on. And we recognize that with the APD Academy, the funding for the eight Lease vehicles is in this line of one million seven hundred seventy-two thousand is from the forfeiture fund. So um, I think if uh, I'll turn it over to the assembly, if you have questions about maintenance and operations. Mr. Flynn. Ms. Johnston? Bring you in the next 60 days. And when you do, I'd be interested in what, how much the facility we currently use, how much 
it's it's fully utilized by the muni, and it, I don't think it has ever not been used by the muni. It was originally muni land. We it was exchanged to a private developer in 2002, one so something like that as part of a multi parcel land exchange, um, uh, whereby the municipality lost or, or gave up ownership of the land, maintained a lease. And that's the lease that expires in 2016, or at the end of 2015. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's the the contingency we're planning for at this point. And then my only other question, to Maury, since I have you here, mm -hmm. is uh, what's the status of the Hellside Road and Drainage Commission? Um, we haven't met in a few months. Uh, the consultant uh, has prepared a report, a, a draft report with some recommendations for potential uh, um, reorganizations or alternatives for service areas or potential stormwater utility. And uh, that's been distributed to committee members. And I think different members have just been out of town. So we should have a meeting to go over that. an APD all this year, yeah. I think they're aware. Yeah. It just seems like it's all. I think that's a good question. I'm going to begin. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Mr. Trainee. I've got a question on here. APD uh, headquarters roof replacement. All those projects are going to be under five million. What's that roof going to cost us to replace? That should you should. I don't think you should assume that everything on there uh, can be funded for six million. I think well, that's generally five million. the highest priorities for facility maintenance. Um, specifically, the APD oh, yeah. headquarters roof replacement. Well, it's for, said it's no, this whole list right here is five million. Yeah, this is separate. Uh, Two point three, and I'm incorrect. Actually, the, um, uh, the that full list of projects can be funded for the five million dollars. <coughs> can you give us a breakdown of each of those projects, yep. Mike, please? Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, Mr. Trainee, Mr. Mboski. Can you give me an update on where we're standing? I haven't been in a year, so I'm no. sure it's taken care of fact, now, but the tire shop, the other entities that were in the tire shop, that were the least to stand on those, or have we been taking care of them? Yeah, we need just, a breakdown. Um, yeah, yeah we've completely taken over the building. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. the, this summer, the um, I think there were two or three tenants. Those leases were uh, expired and not renewed. So uh, utilization-wise, um, obviously, that was it, it dovetailed into half the question about Bear Street, school, but Jennifer got that one. Mm -hmm. So, no, what exactly? How are we utilizing that building? Character. It is now essentially the light I think so. shop. So, uh, the majority of the light duty equipment that the Fleet Davis Department maintains is maintained at that shop. It is no longer just the tire shop, per se. So, Bearing Street is primarily the heavy shop. And uh, the, the the new what we used to call the tire shop, the one just south of Tudor, uh, uh, Street. yeah, just inside, yeah, Fairbank Street, just inside of uh, Old Seward, is now the light duty shop. Okay, so, so a lot of police cars. Sure. So we don't expect any major maintenance issues or building uh, capital needs for that particular building. No, you've just seen. Uh, right. Yeah. There's a, a four hundred thousand uh, dollar uh, item on the uh, that was introduced at the last meeting. meeting yeah. yeah, introduced at the last meeting and is set for public hearing on Tuesday night, which will fully fund uh, the completion of the work at the at that facility. I just want to make sure there wasn't anything else uh, Not anticipated at this time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zimbowski. I don't see any other questions. Uh, Mr. Wilbur, please continue. So my next um, <coughs> next item is office. So the municipal manager's office is a, um, uh, it, it used to be a slightly larger group, but as a result of the reorganization, some of the function of the manager's office has shifted to community and economic development. The retained functions of the manager's office are myself and uh, Joy, who all of you know and enjoy as much as, as we do. Uh, risk management, uh, emergency management, and 
station inspection. Um, those are the other primary functions, and that's what, as a budget team, adds up to, in the 2016 budget, 18 full-time and two part-time positions. The only significant change personnel-wise in that budget is in emergency management. Their office assistant will convert from a full-time to a part-time employee, and that's basically the only significant personnel change. The, the only significant dollar change in the conversion from 15 to 16, other than the reorg, is we're anticipating less uh, a combination of workers' comp and liability program. We're expecting our self-insurance program to be less expensive next year than it was last year. And other than that, there's a few minor adjustments here and there, but that's the, those, that's the only significant change in the program. Thank you, Mr. Abbott. I have a question since I don't see any hands yet. Okay, so this, um, the senior office associate position that's going to go from full-time to part-time, that position is filled, I'm assuming? That is, that is correct. Uh, does that person in that position realize that that position is going to be part-time now and have they, are they okay with it? Uh, that person does know about the proposed budget. Um, I don't know off the top of my head whether the employee will be satisfied with that. I believe they will have um, uh, some rights under, I believe it's a non-rep position right now, although don't pull me to that, it could be A and EA. Um, and uh, as a result of this conversion, that employee would have the option to consider other positions uh, if they were unsatisfied with the part-time job. I believe the job will still be benefit pairing. Um, it, I don't, I, I, well, I'm, I'm not going to. Yeah, but but it's a cons it's a concern to me because it's you know. Um, anyway, I was going to get personal, but I won't. But when somebody's in a full time position and then it's cut um, to part time because of budget constraints, that's really difficult. And so I'm hopeful that if that person is not okay with it, that things will work out so that that person will um, continue to maintain employment within the municipality at the full-time level. Absolutely, and under either the contract if it's AMEA or the code if it's a non-rep, they're given <coughs> preferences for other positions. If they want to maintain their current employment status, they'd be a they would be eligible for consideration for any, in, in fact preferred, for any uh, other vacancies that they were qualified for. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abbott. And I think they have that for a year or two. Okay, great. All right, I don't see any questions. Mr. Wilbur, please continue. So in public transportation, um, had, uh, through some adjustments in their budget, they will be adding a couple bus drivers, um, and then they will have a reduction in their uh, fuel budget to accommodate in part for increases in the uh, budget. Um, obviously, the bonds, uh, when we do projects in uh, transit, you know, the bonds, there's an element component. And then again, they're going to continue to provide some projected savings in 2016 uh, from their fuel. And then on their capital program, many of you are familiar with this, their capital program is primarily used to match the Federal Transit Administration's uh, dollars that are programmed through the uh, AMAS program. So I think uh, I'll turn it over to Ms. Cars and her team. If you have any questions, Ms. Johnston, sir. Thank you, Mr. Wilbur. Ms. Johnston. Yeah, last year you were
Nothing is envisioning increases in the writers. Say that again. Nothing is envisioning a rate increase in the writers. No. We need to get that message out. So you want to talk? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Ms. Dombowski? Can you talk to me about potential service impacts, specifically for the Chugia and the lower area, if there are any? We, we don't have any. The only um, uh, negative impact on our budget is a uh, reduction in our fuel budget um, because we had anticipated fuel being a little bit higher. Um, there are no other um, proposed um, cuts or changes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dombowski. Mr. Traney? Can we make sure we get the message out to the writing public that the rates are not going to go up? Pardon, Can we make sure we ma get the message out to the writing public that the rates are not going to be increased with this budget? Because every you year. That, I mean, uh, we would do that if uh, we were confident the assembly was was comfortable with that. I'm comfortable. I don't know about the rest of them, but I'm comfortable with that. I'd like to tell the public to write some us that every year gets whipshod back and forth. They're worried about rates structure going up that we're not planning, at least with your current budget, Mike, of raising the rates. Absolutely not. Okay. I mean, we agree with you 100%. I just want to make sure that the, you know, that we don't get out in front of the assembly on that and make a commitment that... Uh, but the budget you're submitting has no rate increase. Correct. Is that, that correct? Is correct? I would be comfortable with that message getting out, Mike. Okay. Because I'm just worried about the people that ride the bus that are so dependent upon it, they get whipshod back and forth. And let's kill the message before it gets out there that the rates are going to go up because they're not going up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Traney. If I can follow up with Mr. Traney's comments before I go to the rest of my colleagues. Uh, he makes a very good point because the message out there is that we're $11 million shortfall. So there may very well be bus riders wondering, oh my goodness, is that going to affect the um, bus fare? So I, I agree with Mr. Traney. Thank you. Ms. Johnston. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was just noticing that the, the number of van pool participants seem to be going down <clears throat> a little bit here. Do you have any idea why that is? I think a lot of times the reason that people start getting out of ride share modes and back into their car is the price of fuel. I think I might be the only person who prays that gas prices go up. <laughs> no. None of it helps our price for barrel oil. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Peterson. I don't see any other questions. Mr. Wilbur, please continue. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're doing good. We're doing good. So, um, Public Works Administration, too, the new organization, um, um, the Public Works Department, of Growth and the Office of Economic Community Development, will do some administrative duties that will be help manage both um, the Department of uh, Operation and Maintenance, the Traffic Department, and uh, Project Management Engineering, and these folks will be uh, available to help manage that administration. So. Again, similar to Mike's comments about uh, the changes in his budget and staffing, um, this is just reflection primarily as a, a reorganization. Uh, there is one reduction of a staff proposed, reduction of a staff member um, in the administration as a result of this reorganization. So yes, can we that will uh, turn over to the assembly mm -hmm. and then uh, well, you should ask me some questions if you know they're going to be on. Thank you, Mr. Wilbur. Um, I don't see any questions, but I think Mr. Traney might have a question. 
Ms. Gray Jackson asked a question earlier. Does this person you said we're eliminating one position? We're, there, well, actually, there's two. One okay. is the former public works director position. Okay. And the other is a vacant um, uh, uh, admin support clerk. So there's no body residing in the position? That's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Small Training. Question. I don't see any other questions. Mr. Rover, please continue. Madam Chair. So our next, um, our next group of departments is the Chief Fiscal Officer. We're back on track. I see Mr. Harris here, so if you could just and ease the five minutes on the pressing down. And You're a little ahead of schedule, Madam Chair. It's wonderful, we yeah. We started. Good. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I think most of you know the Chief Fiscal Officer, Robert Harris. Um, Mr. Harris is responsible for um, not only his office, but also Treasury, um, Finance, the Controller's Office, and the uh, appraiser. So, um, his, purchasing. and purchasing. And so, his uh, next group of individuals will be, um, we'll start off with his office alone. And really, um, you know, one of the, uh, had, his office had a one time spending that related to uh, looking at RCA cost allocation plan for RCA review and I believe that process is uh, underway and so uh, that one-time funding is not in the continuation budget the same amount of staffing except for the salary adjustments really no no new news on this one right here uh, for 2016's replaced to his office of three so if you have any questions I Ms. Dombowski uh, Mr. Harris can you talk to us about the decision not to appeal the MLRB um, hmm. A good, the question. On good question. Because I thought the last we spoke that we had a pretty strong case for, obviously they didn't reconsider it, uh, but we had a pretty strong case for going forward. But why why, why now the about phase? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think the decision ultimately came down to weighing whether or not we thought uh, pursuing a legal recourse was the best avenue for towards reinstating the dividend and whether or not that would result in a, uh, a process that might take four years to resolve or three to four years versus um, going back and reassessing why the dividend question was even there and maybe addressing some of the RCA concerns coming forward with a different plan or trying to reinstate the dividend more quickly by going back yeah, to the RCA and saying we're, we're now back asking for that dividend. Um, uh, reinstating the dividend is one of my priority items. So I guess I'm, I'm not tracking. I, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but if, I mean, my understanding is you were pretty passionate that we really should have gotten that dividend. Yes. And then now we made the decision to basically just step back and say, okay, well, we lost, they won. We're not going to pursue further actions to get it. But are, are we really setting ourselves up for um, you basically, um, I guess in legal terms, you know, it's kind of like there's a case on the record that says this is it. So we're looking at case law now. I mean, with the RCA, I mean, what, I don't know what the specific items were. Why? What are we addressing? going forward to maybe, maybe like the, maybe have a likely outcome that we'll get the dividend again? Or have we just kind of shot ourselves in the foot basically by establishing a benchmark that the municipality of Anchorage has just thrown in the towel and said the RCA is right? I'm kind of concerned about that. I, I appreciate that concern. Um, so um, what I've talked about before is that um, MLP is an, it's, it's an investor-owned utility and it serves at 25 to 30% of people of Anchorage. The other 70 to 75 percent of the people who, Anchorage, who are representing the ownership of that utility do, I think, have a reasonable, reasonable expectation that they would be paid um, a dividend to reflect their ownership value in that utility. So I'm a huge proponent of us having a dividend. I think you know, the impact, as we're seeing here, as we try to find ways to cut from the 2016 budget um, all throughout the organization is um, acutely felt. The issue about whether or not to try to go to Security Court and appeal the specific issues upon which um, the RCA denied, <coughs> essentially said you just can't you can't pay a dividend. 
Um, uh, this might probably the better answer would be given by Bill Falsey um, because he was he's the one that would that would be um, really a better on point to talk about those issues. But I don't want to just can down the road to him. Although certainly when he's here talking about legal, that might be a great question for him. Um, but the question would be, what in Superior Court could we win based on the decisions the RCA made and how they made it? And so we're now we're not talking about whether we should be paid a dividend, but the process upon which decisions are not paid a dividend. And ultimately, now you're in a question of really kind of boils down to, did the RCA have the jurisdiction and discretion to be able to say, we're not going to allow a dividend to be paid? And that's a, that's a different issue than the question going back to pre forth a a um, reasoned argument that, in fact, this is an investor-owned utility. We've invested this amount of money. A reasonable expectation for anyone who owns a utility is that they can pay some form of dividend. I mean, in, in the world of in the world of investment, typically when you own part of a utility, you own some utility stocks. It's because you want to have that stable, known return. You don't have to have any worries about you getting paid because that's what people invest in utilities. So, um, to me, I think the decision about uh, that decision was about whether or not we would succeed on the merits of debating with the RCA and jurisdiction and had followed the proper process as opposed to whether or not that should earn a dividend. I think that actually is very helpful because, as we know in, in court cases, a lot of times it's the question that's important, not necessarily. I mean, that's what the judge is looking at or the court is looking at often is how the question is phrased. And yeah. That, that's helpful. Um, regarding. Um, Oh, I just totally blanked. <laughs> we'll wait for it. We'll wait. Oh, we'll wait for you. Okay, I have one of them. I had two in my mind. I didn't write down. Okay, the other thing, um, you, I don't know if you were here when we were having a discussion with the fire department regarding um, their, uh, uh, regarding the potential and the forward, going forward of creating, um, basically budgeting for replacement costs within the current budgets. Um, would that be something that, um, have you had those discussions? Is that something that, you know, you can help? Um, Lance is obviously interested in it. Um, you'd rather than putting a bond out for a fire truck. Over the years, why don't we start talking about a replacement fund and start actually budgeting for it every single year because we know those costs are coming. Um, is that something that you've talked about? Is that something you're interested in? What are your thoughts? Well, I, I apologize. I missed the uh, fire department um, review, but I'd be happy to talk to plans about that. Um, you know, anytime you establish and retain a CT fund, it's essentially going to fund both either deferred maintenance or expected maintenance, you know, things that are coming along. Um, you're certainly better off doing that than simply waiting until the assets run the course of its life and now you simply have no choice but to replace it. So I'm certainly, I, I'm, yeah, that was the conversation. Yeah. And, and I, 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 would, I would appreciate that proactive conversation because I think long term that that um, lends itself to sustain, sustainable and stable funding, um, especially when we know we know these assets are going to have to be replaced. Um, our population probably is not going to get smaller. Um, the last question: I understand you recently were speaking with Bond Council regarding, um, um, and I just want to update as far as where you see the city of Anchorage. Um, our AAA bond rating, the city's fiscal picture, and how that conversation went with um, those that are basically in control. <laughs> oh, thank you, uh, I'm sure the the, uh, I don't think I have anything new to share from the last time to discuss this issue. I think that we we'll uh, we'll we'll still see out the city what they are seeing uh, justified the bond rating being somewhat um, you can't uh, uh, considered independently of what's going around with us in this macro economy in the state of Alaska or even the federal government. Um, uh, you know, we have, in, in our instance, we still have a fairly diverse revenue series of revenue streams, um, absent, of course, now in the dividend, um, as opposed to the state, which is 85% dependent upon oil revenues, oil tax revenues. And um, so I don't, I don't uh, Give me know this time. Down. Okay. Um, that you risk it. Yeah. Or, uh, I'm going to ask how long the freeze was. Just put me back on. I'll ask him then. How long the freeze? Yeah. Well, okay.
And the last question I have as the CFO, have you had a chance to or begun the discussions um, relating to a potential tax on marijuana? And have you formulated a recommendation as to where that tax might fall? Thank you. Um, that's actually the um, so development of those tax. Um, a uh, potential tax revenues is being handled through Treasury, which is one of the um, uh, groups that I oversee. And I believe uh, Dan Moore will be here uh, during this budget work session. I think he be the appropriate person to talk about that. I believe they're making progress both on, on considering what that tax would look like, how we tax it. Um, you know, the difference, of course, being an excise tax as we do for cigarettes and alcohol, um, you know, it's every carbon's more, every bottle's more, as opposed to a sales tax, because right there you don't have a, you know, it's possible you could have, I don't know how many growers you could have in acreage, and so an excise tax might be less efficient for us than simply some form of sales tax, but um, Dan Moore, our treasurer, has been working on that, but I think he has some good ideas to bring forward for consideration. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boski. Mr. Traney. How long, thank you, Mr. Harris, how long was the freeze the RCA created thank on you. our dividend? A time frame, and did they put give the rationale for what criteria they wanted us to meet so they would lift the freeze? Or was it just a super eight ball where they just drunk a number out of it? I'm they, trying to I, figure out what they did. I believe, uh, thank you, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure. I believe the uh, language they used was that penalty is not allowed to pay dividend. That was it. That was it. Mm. Not I'll ask Mr. Falls the rest of it. And you're right on the marijuana thing, because we've got a question whether we do excise or sales tax. And there's a real difference in how you collect it and how the product is marketed as it goes for sale. So we'll ask the treasurer to talk to us about it. Well, with respect to that, you know, there's Colorado and some of the states that are you know, tax revenues that are going to be tax So interesting times ahead of us. Thank you, Mr. Harris, for being here. Thank you, Mr. Traney. Thanks, Mr. Steele. Uh, yeah, go going back a little bit to the RCA, uh, I have seen it. I have seen on appeals uh, for RCA where folks go back and look at the decisions that were made when when it first started or on other like cases. Thank you, Mr. Steele. <coughs> okay, Ms. Johnston. I was just going to add that wasn't the decision on a debt equity ratio, and that so the dividend was well, based capital. on okay, thought we had debt too much capital. The way that you can go back is either by increasing the debt equity ratio. I don't or, remember seeing that. Or how it relates to the other utilities <laughs> on the rail belt and their debt equity ratio. Um, but that wasn't a basically the debt equity, so that we can always go back if we've improved our debt equity and reinstate. Yes, that was that was the um, argument given for right. why we were denied the dividend. Right. Although I would argue that um, as an investor-owned utility, wholly owned by the municipality of Anchorage, backed by the full faith and credit of the municipality of Anchorage, you tell me that in fact with thirty. 
removed from the budget as a result, result of our e ERP or our SAP program. Um, and the finance department is feeling most of those changes, um, which is about, I think it's eight positions out of the 16. And so, um, really, we removed those, those one time dollar numbers as we've done in the past. And then, <coughs> as a result of SAP and figuring out since we've gone into pause and then figuring out how we're going to advance forward um, these positions while they, the PCNs are still alive. The uh, funding for them to be capitalized in 2016 when we start back up. Treasury had some requests and some uh, some adjustments in their postal and, and some other modifications that they, they wanted to include. Uh, and I think as you get to your uh, work session on uh, revenues, the Treasury will have a part of that conversation. So um, I think uh, finance is definitely a key role in not only what we, how we manage our money, as uh, Mr. Harris mentioned, but they also will potentially, well, they will play a key role in uh, the startup of our ERP when we get moving forward. So um, I think if you have any questions of finance, um, I know that you guys have a work session starting in about 35 minutes. Many of those questions, many of that work session may be related to the questions you might have as it relates to their budget. So if we're not able to answer them now, they'll certainly get back to you with a response. So with that, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Wilber. Fortunately, we're right on schedule. Ms. Johnston. Um, I will say my opinion question. Question. But the Treasury. Um, <coughs> Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Ms. Zimboski? Uh, thank you. Um, what effort is going to be made in the 2016 year to reassess those that are receiving a nonprofit tax exemption that don't even qualify anymore? So let me, let me start with that one. Um, as many of you know, the Budget Advisory Commission had submitted a report to talk about um, property tax exemptions, and the mayor has reviewed the report, and I'm pretty sure that he's talked to the chair of the Budget Advisory Commission. He's very interested to look at what the recommendations are in that report, and how and when we would advance those as well. Um, you know, what, it won't necessarily increase the amount, but what it will do is spread evenly the, uh, the cost to um, everyone mm -hmm. as, as much as possible. So if he's aware, um, he's read it. Um, and I think you know, one of the things we're going to be talking to the administration is about what are those key things that I know is on his mind. And I know it's on the Budget Advisory Commission's mind, so. Um, okay, and that, that yeah, as I said, that's been one of the things, um, since their report came out, I've been harping on for a while. And, uh, you know, I think 
a lot of people agree that there's some nonprofits that should, you know, they qualify, they should get the exemption. But there's a lot of nonprofits out there that are getting the exemption that just don't even qualify anymore. So other taxpayers are subsidizing that, that you know, tax break, basically. And I think for us to look at that, it's a, it's a wise thing. Um, with that said, I assume the IT upgrade that, that property appraisal needs is still on the back burner behind SAP. Is that accurate, or can this some of this work start start to be done with 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 the current situation where they're at now? Madam well, Chair, if I can um, respond to the question, Mr. Uh, Belsky. Then, uh, yes, um, I think four years ago when they were first trying to think about the, uh, an upgrade to our property appraisal system, that was about the same time we were launching the ERP with SAP, um, and trying to do both at the same time just didn't make any sense. So. Um, you know, after uh, after talking it over with uh, Brian, the assessor, uh, Brian Robbins, our assessor, um, you know, one of the things we've talked about is is uh, beginning the process of ramping up so that when the um, ERP go live piece finally happens, that we would then be in a position to move ahead rather than trying to do two big, two projects at once. Um, you know, I think that idea is to take steps to maintain the equipment, the hardware, and software we have in place now to help us with appraisals, and then um, and then tackle that next. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Brian, I don't know if there's one of anything. Sorry, I'm going to make some comments. We've had uh, a couple of discussions. Thanks. Uh, one last one this week. We uh, uh, trying to plan the steps. Well, with the next committee meeting, I'm probably pretty close to uh, some research information. Research what's available. Uh, we've got we're sort of anticipating uh, reviewing the RFP uh, in June of 2016, and with the idea that we could possibly um, <coughs> reissue an RFP as uh, soon as late 2016 or 2017. That's our current thing. Some of this will be dependent on the other big projects. Okay. Um, and with that said, you know, when we're talking about business personal property tax, there's a lot of businesses out there, we've never captured that. There, what effort has been made to ensure, uh, or to go back and readdress that? Oh, I can take that, sure. Can you come up so I can hear you? Because I, I'm kind of deaf in one ear. Madam Chair, we, um, I think the, four months ago, we hired a dedicated auditor in the, um, in the person property section. And he's he's uh, he's done a fabulous job. He's uh, he's actually begun an audit program. We've completed several audits already. Uh, so so we are taking steps, and we funded a position to to specifically address that issue. And that's not that's looking at those businesses that maybe have never even filed. Well, we we have actively over the years, and we do actively review business audits on an annual basis. And we do involuntary filings uh, for businesses that don't file. Uh, this is taking it a step further, uh, looking for businesses that aren't reporting accurately. Um, and also for non-filers, going out, taking a look at the properties and trying to, try to find out if our uh, involuntary filings are accurate as well. Okay, that's helpful. And the last question um, I have is regarding the pot tax. I don't know if some of you were in the room and you heard me um, ask it earlier. Um, but I was asking what, um, Dan, I'm looking at you, what, um, uh, what analysis have you done, what recommendations are you seeing as we look towards uh, 2016? I'm assuming there's going to be a recommendation for a level of tax on marijuana. And can you speak to that at all? Sure. Uh, we, uh, uh, Food Chair, we've attended a variety of different uh, meetings the Assembly's held on marijuana. Um, and We've done a lot of research in terms of what other jurisdictions have done. Uh, there are different ways to tax it. Uh, we know the state's doing an excise tax, and they're tracking it from seeing through all the different stages. For us, um, we look at it, and our, our recommended approach would be to do a sales tax just on marijuana and marijuana products. Uh, and what that does is it captures the market price uh, a lot more accurately. It also basically taxes higher potency product at a higher rate. So there's a, there's a, if you do an excise tax, it's strictly on the volume of the product. So that, you know, so in some ways we get the best of both worlds. The state does the excise one and we do the sales tax one. 
uh, in terms of you know revenue and what's possible there uh, if it's a sales tax it has to be on the ballot so it'd be the first Tuesday in April uh, if it's on the ballot the assembly would need to decide you know whether it's in or out of the tax cap that type of thing uh, there are a lot of enforcement costs that come along with a new world of marijuana and that means more money for those resources so whatever money could be generated if it is outside the tax cap it's it's going to have to be netted against some of those additional costs so our range, and this is looking at Denver, Portland, Washington, we've extrapolated, it's around three to $5 million annual if all the businesses were built out. Our best estimate was it could be up to 50 retail businesses. But that's gonna take a long time for 50 retail businesses to come into existence. So best case scenario is if the voters approved it in April, and let's say it went into effect around July, because there has to be some ramp up time, we get maybe a half a year of whatever businesses actually can come into existence during that second half of 2016. So, the, and if nothing's budgeted right now for marijuana tax in the budget, but and it's going to be contingent upon the voters, right, if you go that route. So, you will know in early April if the voters said yes or no, and if they said yes, you can put it into your first quarter budget revision, and but be very, very conservative with the amount because that initial year is only a partial year and it's, it's not going to be huge. It may be a million dollars or a million and a half or something. So that's that's basically where we're at with it. If for some reason that uh, initiative were to fail, we could then start looking at excise tax. Excise tax is very difficult to track when you're one jurisdiction. It's easier for the state because they don't care about the boundaries. We do. So like if Palmer said no to marijuana and all of a sudden we've got these boundary issues, it's very hard for us to know where that product came from. Uh, with cigarettes, we know we get the manufacturer reports, so we know when it's actually been shipped into Alaska, and we can validate, and that's how we do our desk audits, and we have a lot of findings, uh, you know, not all the time, but we, we, have, we have some big ones. So, so there's, uh, it is preferred from an audit standpoint, and revenue realization and other, you know, potency, you know, type of things. Uh, there's some real advantages to that, and that's what we're currently proposing. The ordinance itself is probably about 70% written, and uh, we're going to work with law in the next month or two to have them review it. And uh, I know it has to go to you if it's about or it's in January. So. Sure. And so I guess to where I'm going is, you know, we've seen one community in, in Alaska do a 5% sales tax and another community do a 15% sales mm -hmm. tax. Yeah. Are you honing in on a specific recommendation yet for a number? And are you willing to share that or give us a range? Well, I can, I can say the number that I've said before in front of the marijuana group was around 12%. That's going to be subject to the administration and the assembly's final decision. Uh, the 12% actually does have a basis. And it's, uh, it's sort of, I'd say, the low to mid level of, uh, of what other jurisdictions have done. So one concern we have is if you tax too high, you're going to solidify or encourage the black market. We don't want to do that. We know there's a black market. We know reporting on jurisdictions is not going to go away. We certainly don't want to make it grow more. So, so part of the decision is where you set that rate in the beginning, and also what flexibility can you give yourself in the future? Because those market rates are going to change a lot, and you're, I think you're going to want some flexibility on where you set that rate going forward. And that's a little bit of a tricky thing in terms of the ballot proposition, but we're, we're trying to figure out the appropriate language for that. Uh, last question. On, um, with parity with uh, the tobacco tax that's there now, as far as like a percentage, how does yeah. that fall going? It's, it's a, the tobacco effectively is about 25% tax right now. So if, if you buy, and I'm not a smoker, if you buy a cart of cigarettes and it's like a, nearly $100, you're paying almost $25 in just real simple numbers of, of local tax. So it's about 25%. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tomboski. Very quickly, before I go to Mr. Train and Mr. Flynn, I need to follow up on Mr. Tomboski's comments regarding the Budget Advisory Commission's report on property tax extension. First, I'd like to take a moment to thank Shirley Nelson, as the chair of that committee, to thank the Budget Advisory Commission for your work. And I'm really pleased to hear that the mayor has embraced the report and is looking into it. But I also want to say that the assembly has also embraced the report through our Budget and Finance Committee. And we've been talking about it probably for the last four months. And we will continue to have that discussion. And right now, we're working through the, the fire um, residential, the fire sprinkler uh, exemption. So again, um, I wanted to share that. And thank you to the BAC again. Now, um, Mr. Traney. 
Dan, as you're looking at the marijuana tax, sales tax versus excise, please write both of them up, both them up because if the voters turn down the sales tax, then we need to have the excise tax ready to go. Right, and I, I thought about that, and so we're definitely, we have to really focus on one to begin with, but we can be working on another one because the plan we need if, if we need to go right into that. Because I know the people that support marijuana said they want taxed until reality hits. And then they don't want tax. Right. And then one thing, too, I forgot to mention is that uh, if it's an excise tax, the tax is the liability of the business. And I, my understanding is they cannot deduct those expenses because of those federal conflicts, right? So uh, if it's a sales tax, the tax is paid by the consumer. And so that's actually better for the marijuana businesses that that tax is borne by the consumer, not by them. And we figured out, too, how we're going to accept payments whether we require cash payments because of the problem they have with backing industry, right. or what are we going to do? Have you thought about that? We, oh, we thought about it. We, we have a, a secure window on the third floor where we would do it. All right. Uh, we <laughs> take a lot of cash already secure for property window. taxes. Right. Uh, it would be a lot more regular for property taxes. Uh, so we have a facility that can handle that. Uh, we may want to control it like Washington does by appointment, so, we, so they're not all coming in on the same day. Uh, so, but we're definitely thinking about it. We, we went to the state of Alaska meeting this week where they have been a real big issue with that. And uh, we're, so we are definitely trying to prepare ourselves. It won't be fine. We today could handle cash. No. Okay. Okay. That's more like Thank you, Mr. Thank Traney. You. Mr. Flynn? Yeah. Um, if I understood correctly, most of the production and uh, posting SAP project came out of your room. And I believe Mr. Wilbur indicated that should the project be started in this test here shortly, we capitalize all of those conditions. Um, I seem to recall there's some conflict over whether we should capitalize all of those positions versus some of the ones that are operating. And, and, and because I was brought up, you know, yeah. I thought it was the auditors, and I, I think where it really came down to it, and maybe others, but it was at least the training had to be out of operations. Um, and I can't remember what else, but I... Well, I, I don't want to answer today per se, but I do have a takeaway. I'd, I'd like a little closer look at that. And, and if we can't, in fact, capitalize all those positions, what the effect is. I need to resurrect that opinion from our bond council. Yeah, we do. Not bond council, our auditors. Uh, we need it, though. That, um, what we can, in fact, capitalize versus what we have to expense was looked at, I think, uh, a little bit ago, two years ago. So it is laid out, things like training expenses, for example, we can. Um, and then, uh, and Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, but there are certain positions where we would be trying to capitalize that portion of their work that they do over this life of this, uh, of this, of the, of the uh, development part of the project. Um, you know, I, 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 my understanding is we can't capitalize 100% of it, we can capitalize a portion of it. And so we would want to capitalize those portions of it that, in fact, they had. So they it would be an operation. Right, otherwise, otherwise it, it, it fits into an operational impact in time. Yeah, so, yeah. so, so <coughs> presuming that's correct, that there will be an operational impact, I'd, I'd like to see that quantified based on the number of post services we can talk about here. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Flynn, Ms. Johnson, Mr. Steele. Um, <clears throat> yes, on the um, um, the tax of marijuana, we're just talking about retail. So there's no, uh, is there wholesale uh, uh, tax? Is there, I mean, are, are we are we getting the growers and the processors? But through the chair, we're, we're only talking about the very last stage, the retail uh, store. So and then the, the seller has to deal with the other folks in terms mm -hmm. of yeah. Miss Johnson, did you still have something yeah, you wanted well, to say? My question is I'm really just doing that with this, but um, have you looked into value added tax? Uh, we we have no. only because that wouldn't be something that would have to go on the ballot. But it would have to be the whole thing. Yes, I can also put the sales tax in the fifty percent plus one. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Ms. Domboski? Um, just 
just a, I have two mm -hmm. follow-up questions. Just a couple well, of things. One new question, one follow-up. On the on the pot money, um, essentially, you know, we're collecting it as municipality. What liability are we assuming? No, I hear you. Has there been any analysis of that done? Because I know there's a reason that the, the banks aren't taking it. Um, so as a municipality, I mean, until the federal delegation, until the federal level deals with this, there's got to be a liability. How are we managing that liability? Or are we just not? I, I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm oh, sorry, I can't directly answer. I can't say these we don't need law. Some of them just no, and you Thank you. They so talked about much. how the IRS Thank you. right now Really hey, we were already scheduled to have it before. Yeah, so if we go ten minutes over, so what? Uh, so I, I don't, uh, I don't know if it's a real issue or not, but uh, so the next time we're going to be here. I appreciate that. Um, and hmm? this is probably a question for SWS, but since I have all the finance heads here, I'm um, common sense tells me, and I have had, I can't believe how many complaints all the services not paying for it are. I mean, I cannot tell you how many people have complained to me. I mean, at least a hundred. I mean, and that's being kind. Uh, but if I can, you know, have a little PayPal thing on my phone, I can swipe and take people's money in this age where we're talking about all these things that we're doing technologically. And maybe I should nag IT about this when they come up. But there is just no reason why somebody can't go to the dump and swipe their credit card. Um, it's not a question of technology. It's the merchant piece. Well, I was going to say, there's got to be a way to capture that and pass it on, whether it's increased fee if somebody wants to pay with a credit card, or if it's, you know, if you want to pay, pay cash, you don't have to pay the 2%. But there's got to be a way to do that. And I, this is something that I have heard at least 100 times from people saying, this is stupid. If I had to pay an extra 50 cents to use my credit card, I'm happy to do it. But they have to run to the ATM and get it, you know. I, I, uh, Chair, I know exactly what you're talking about. I've had that in my own experience there. Um, Solid Waste actually approached us because we managed the credit card contract of, I don't know, the last year, and they want to offer credit card. And uh, and the credit card rules have changed very recently. They offer credit card But actually allow it to be passed on. So to, we are actively right. working with them right now, literally, to get these machines and devices in place. But there is a transaction fee that goes along with it. And uh, that is something that's in the works. So. Well, I, I'd say let's plug ahead on that one because yeah. that has been surprisingly, one of the biggest complaints I've heard in the past year is people say, if I have to pay an extra 50, 50 cents or a buck 50 or whatever to be able to swipe their debit card or their credit card, I mean, this is just, I mean, to me, I think it should be an option for people when they go to the dump. The landfill, sorry. No, that's okay. Thank you, Mr. Mboski. I don't see any other questions, but I but I have a question. Um, Mr. Moore. Okay, because I pay all my, everything I possibly can with credit card from miles, you know. And so AWW is the only municipal entity that doesn't charge a fee. And I think we had this conversation before. And how, I mean, everybody else does, you know, but it's worth it to me. But AWW doesn't, it's really great. So why? I mean, I'm glad. Don't change it. I don't know how? Why. Thank you. I, I honestly how? don't know why, because a lot of the other regulated utilities have switched to you have to pay. So whether it's Chugach or NSTAR, they make you pay a fee. I know that. And, uh, ABU effectively, all their rate base, which is 90-some thousand accounts, uh, they're all subsidizing the cost of that. And, you Ooh. know, it's... I, it's, I don't know. I really don't know why. Well, you, you can follow up with an answer to that question. Okay. But thank you. Okay, I don't see any other um, questions. So, Mr. Wilbur, so let's we're continue. We're for our last two. We have uh, IT, and we have the capital program as well. So, with the IT department, similar to finance, um, five Maybe. of the <laughs> 16 positions um, that are... Uh, the reduction for 2016 are positions related to SAP that will again be capitalized with Trust Watson, the acting IT director, um, can answer any questions. And I think, Mr. Mowski, in relation to your comments about, um, or Mr. Ryan's comments about the appraisal system, uh, we are programming some other funds to get that proper appraisal system back up and revised in the capital program. So, on the operating side of IT, um, we, I'll turn it over to the chair. And if you have any questions, please um, let's go. 
Thank you, Mr. Wilbur. Mr. Training. So what operating system are we using? Is it Windows 3, Windows 7? I keep hearing complaints from people. In one part of town, they turn on the machine, it's Windows 3. Another one is Windows 7. And heavens knows, when do we get one operating system that's at least supported by Microsoft? So through the chair, the, uh, the city has appropriated back in April with your assistance yeah. uh, 4.6 billion to upgrade the systems here at the, uh, the city. One, one big part of that is upgrading all the legacy hardware, the desktops that you speak of, to the current operating system. For us at the city, that standard is Windows 7. There's 800 or so machines that would have to be upgraded as a result of that. In addition, we're Just looking at a execution of a Microsoft license agreement that would allow us to upgrade the office environment. And then we're also looking at professional services and software upgrades for the departmental software that's used to department by department. So we're working with those, on those plans with Robert to actually get that understood, how we're going to execute on that. And we would hope to execute on that in the next uh, quarter or two. Is the 4.7 million enough? We will determine that. We will determine what the cost is and to be able to report back to you on that. In some cases, we have some computers that are turning a product out that another office can't yes, bring that's in. Yes, understanding, too. And that just doesn't work for a town yes. our size. Mm -hmm. Robert, I'm sorry. You wanted to say oh, something, okay. sir? Uh, Mr. Um, Chain, um, uh, if I could do this tomorrow, I would do it tomorrow. I would do it with all the haste. I think that we have a number of systems in our in our portfolio, a number of these Windows XP machines that I think we there, there are no bonus points for waiting to get them upgraded. Windows has uh, Microsoft has stopped supporting uh, those machines, and you know, if there's any hackers that are listening, please don't. Um, but you know, it's just it's just it's, it's a, it, it, the security of our system is is, is, is of great importance. Uh, the security of our data and the data of our of our uh, residents. Um, you know, these systems we use, we want to make sure that we have a solid system. So part of your question was, do, is, is 4.7 going to be enough? And part of the answer that we're still looking at, someone that's been kind of one of those things you have to look at first, is that some of those XP machines are, are working with apps that would also have to migrate and be uh, upgraded. That's going to have some cost or some workarounds in order to be able to make that work. Or I think you're doing working on an inventory of what what apps are out there that are running on XP machines, and that we would, if we're going to, if we're going to make a transition, um, you know, what that's going to look like in terms of additional money to, to bring those <coughs> XP apps up to current operating systems. With Windows 10, the current operating system, it seems to me that it might be better for you guys to look at going right to 10 versus trying to take some machines, bring them up to 7, which is already becoming obsolete. Just use 10, get a license from Microsoft. Correct. Right. Um, that is an opportunity, um, but we are limited somewhat to those apps, those apps that Robert was mentioning. And while we would love to move to Windows 10, there are some of the apps that we just can't move forward yeah. to Windows 7. And when you look at a corporate environment, we tend to, at the size and the complexity that we are, we tend to lag a little bit behind Microsoft. I did mention that we're uh, pursuing that Microsoft licensing. With that Microsoft licensing, we would have the opportunity to go back and upgrade those desktops and bring them forward when that opportunity did arise, though. So that would likely possibly arise first for us in the fall of 2016. But as Robert mentioned, we want to execute now and eliminate the XP boxes as soon as we can. So we'll probably make that intermediate step with seven. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Thank Trini. You, um, I, I have a question. Is there any work being done to improve the, the web-based MUNI portal? It's really, really bad. It's how we retrieve our, our emails you know, from outside the municipality, and it's really bad. Is there, are there work being done? Yes, that's actually another ancillary project. We are going to be upgrading the Microsoft Exchange environment. That's what hosts the email environment Great. for us. Um, it is a couple versions behind as well. As we move it forward, that service will improve as well. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. I don't see any other. Ms. Domboski? Um, most of my questions regarding IT will surround around, uh, around the SAP. Because I think that will be something instantaneously people will appreciate. And um, I think, you know, functionally, it, you know, whether it's a, a fee we serve, tack on here or not, I think um, from an IT perspective and finance perspective. Thank you, Ms. Domboski. I don't see other any other questions. Mr. Wilbur, let's continue. All right. So the last one is the purchasing department. 
purchasing good. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Wilbur. Mr. Trainey? Good to see you here. I was approached by an auctioneer last night. It can be a council meeting. Wanted to know why our contract to auction off city property went out five months after we gave the last one. Okay. Okay, and that's getting rid of all city property, yes. surplus property we decided to. Okay. Then I'll let them know. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Probably getting more people bidding on it. I know when with the guns, for example, when we went worldwide on purchasing it, those who can buy it, the amount of money we got on those firearms went up dramatically. Yes, sir. We are doing that on, on the new option. Thank or you, sir. The new RFP. Okay. RFP. Thank you, Mr. Trainee. Anything else, Mr. No. Trainee? Thank you, Mr. Trainee. I don't. Ms. Dombowski? Um, Ron, I'm just going to put you on the spot. Is there anything in your budget where you feel um, either is sufficient or that we can make improvements? Okay. In the last comment I'll make, I do not want to see anything like the Unimark from the back. So I know that that, that was discussed previously in previous months. And um, I, I hope that was just a talking point because I think it's completely uh, inefficient, actually. So I'll just put that on the record. Thank you, Mr. Mboski. Um I don't see any other questions, and it looks like we have completed our work session right on time. So if there's no other comments, I'm going to... I think it was great. Does anybody have any concerns? I think it was great. Um, we had extra time on some departments and less time on others, and so we're finishing right on time. So thank you. Work session adjourned.